Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Couch Coding WordPress Performance. Your experts for today are Pantheon co-founders Matt Cheney and David Strauss, and agency and community engineer Andrew Taylor. Just a few housekeeping items to go over before we start. Please make sure you submit any questions you have during the session in the question window. We want to answer as many of your questions during the presentation as possible, so keep sending them in. Also, the session will be recorded, and the recording will be made available to everyone next week. I'd now like to turn it over to Matt, David, and Andrew. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Couch Coding. We'll be talking about WordPress performance, as Atusa mentioned, on hopefully your favorite website management platform for WordPress sites. Um, and our goal today is to help you speed up your site, to talk about some of the tips and ideas and speculations that we have about um, how you can make your site perform real quick. Because, um, you know, making things fast is often good, and making your website fast is good for your users, it's good for your search engine results, and it's just making people happier. Because nothing is worse, well, actually a lot of things are worse, but it's certainly not good if you're trying to like load up a web page and then you're like having to wait there, wait there, and then eventually you get it. Like a lot of people will leave, a lot of people won't care, a lot of people won't be able to read as much as they want, and that, that limits stuff. So we're trying to make WordPress fast like this turtle with a rocket. Although that may not be actually that safe for the turtle. Although that is a great metaphor for how you accelerate PHP there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, so we basically, for today, like, we're going to talk about a few tips and stuff that um, our colleague Emily Miller did in this blog post. Uh, and then we're going to, Andrew Taylor, who's quite fantastic, is going to go through some tips and tricks as well. And then we're just going to take a bunch of questions on how to make WordPress fast and some of the stuff Pantheon can do, some of the stuff you can do on your own, and, you know, generally just get into this. So we have this blog post, Expert Tips for Optimizing WordPress Performance. It got, like, sort of done up with some graphic design that involves some nostalgia, like, with video game characters, which hopefully, you like, not to say we, like, play a lot of games here at Pantheon, but um, I guess it's like aesthetically pleasing. Plus, like you can, uh, because it's like video games and blocky letters, like the images can be compressed much smaller because there's less detail, and that makes your website faster. So this is sort of part of where we're so going. Go for pixel art. Yeah. So eight bit is the best bit, and you know, we did that for uh, never mind. Okay. So it's got this sort of game mentality here, but the idea is that you know. Performance is like a sort of video game in the sense that you're, you're constantly leveling up what you're doing. There's no like end goal in performance. I mean, I mean theoretically, I guess, the what you type the web page and it immediately shows up. But that's not going to happen. What's going to happen is that there are things you can do, things that you can do on a server level, on a code level, on like a CDN level, that are going to move your site in a faster and faster level. And so a lot of what really we're trying to like encourage you to do is not necessarily like make your site perfect, but just find some basic things that maybe you haven't done already or could do to make your site faster. And that helps you level up, which is, of course, uh, pretty awesome. Um, and I think that, you know, sort of as part of sort of the understanding of, of performance, I think, you know, we really want to sort of take the kind of conceptual angle for performance that you might take with security in the sense that, like, having a good secure, you know, situation involves sort of defense and depth, where you have a number of different levels where you're, you know, giving security help. To, to make your site secure. And I think the same thing is true for performance. There's a lot of different levels you can do as well. And they're kind of related, because the better your performance is, the better your cache hits are, uh, the further from the brink you are in terms of denial of service. And that's, you know, you want to stay online, you want to stay fast, and you want to make sure that each part of your stack is optimized. Like, there's some stuff that you get, we'll talk about in Pantheon right out of the box for performance, it helps. But, you know, there's things that you can do further down the stack, and things you can do to optimize those things. They're all going to help you. And so that's sort of where we're going with this. I think the other thing sort of emphasize is that, you know, the WordPress CMS itself, the actual PHP code, typically is going to be, you know, a, a, can be one of the biggest bottlenecks on your site. It's the thing where you can customize the most and, you know, the thing that maybe, you know, is the hardest to debug because it ends up being very, you know, specific to each site. So we'll talk a little bit about that and how you can sort of test your code and stuff like that for performance, which seems like a good plan to me. So let's talk about uh, a few things here, just in terms of like just high-level tips. So the first thing, which is you're going to get on Pantheon just by virtue of using uh, WordPress and Pantheon, is you know if you're trying to make a fast website, you want to use as modern a version of PHP as possible. 
that, you know, especially with PHP uh, 5.5, you have an opcode cache built into language. You have a lot of, of stuff working a lot faster. And that, you know, this is the kind of thing that is improving. And this is true for PHP 5.5, but this is also going to be true um, as more people move to PHP 7, which is even faster still. Um, basically, it's the same code. You know, there's some language differences between the versions. Not, not crazy, but that the actual code itself runs faster, and that's obviously, that's obviously a pretty big deal. So, you know, certainly you've got a Pantheon the, the PHP 5.5, which is great. And when we roll out PHP 7, that's something to definitely take advantage of. That will very much help your WordPress site. It's tip one. Tip two is that um, one of the things that WordPress is great at is it creates a lot of these, you know, complex data objects which are used to render pages and, you know, do the kind of CMS technology that we all know and love. The problem, though, from a performance standpoint is that these, these are really actually pretty big objects that, you know, oftentimes are in the database, draft to be compiled, and for every page load, we sort of got to regenerate the same thing. And that's something that, you know, can, of course, be cached. Anything we're doing repetitively that's the same can be cached. Uh, but this isn't the kind of like opcode cache PHP thing that we're talking about before. This is sort of a, an object or data structure cache. And so uh, situations like Redis or memcache sort of will keep that load and sort of keep those objects in memory so you're not dealing with the database. And that will reduce the amount of time uh, that it takes to access those objects. And that's something uh, that will make your site run faster. And that can take a little more work because to actually make that work, you actually need a Redis or a uh, memcache uh, instance to also, you know, be in conjunction with the other web stack. Luckily on Pantheon, we have Redis as an option uh, for sites. It's one of the add-ons. You sort of go under the site dashboard and you can enable Redis. That'll, like, set up the bindings and such so that you have a Redis, a Redis, a Redis uh, data store on Pantheon. And then in, uh, what you'll need to do is also get a, you have a Redis plugin that um, uh, Daniel Bachhuber and some folks at Pantheon work together to make to uh, allow you to actually install that into your WordPress site, and then that'll you know, give it some of the configuration that's coming out of Pantheon uh, so that it connects there. And then as WordPress needs these big data objects, it'll first check the Redis cache to see if it has it, and then it'll give it back to you and make your site faster. And this is going to be really helpful, too, especially if you have more complicated use cases. Maybe you have a lot of logged in users doing content authoring that, you know, the more of that kind of activity, the more helpful these kinds of object cache will be. And that's something to probably the easiest. All the things we talked about today, that's the one thing that maybe I think most people we work with don't have, haven't done yet and can definitely benefit from because it's already on Pantheon. It already has a plugin. It's a pretty straightforward thing to put together. And um, that's something I would throw out there for people's. Tip three is um, making sure to use first proxy cache for your site. So this is basically sort of similar to the, the, the concept of like uh, data structure cache you're talking about with Redis. Varnish and the first proxy cache that we implement at Pantheon are things that will basically store the entire HTML output of and all of the content assets of the website. That WordPress does a lot of work, for example, to like generate what like our blog is going to look like, and with all the different formatting and and other pieces to it. Uh, and then maybe that blog is really popular, and like 5,000 people want to see it, 50,000 people want to see it, 500,000 people want to see it. It's all the same thing, you know. It doesn't have custom stuff depending on who's looking at it. And so having a system like Varnish allows you to, to just cache that stuff at the edge, at like on our on our infrastructure as one of the first things that the request goes through. And if you just want that same blog everybody else wants, you know, bam, 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 we just kick it right back to you. No problem. Uh, very, very fast. And it's very, like, you know, like several orders of magnitude faster than having WordPress do it. Because WordPress has to take in the request. It has to, like, you know, do a bunch of PHP stuff, talk to the database, put some, you know, stuff together, and then, and then stick it back out. This just, this just works. And every site on Pantheon, from the dev sites, the small sites, the big sites, all use this. And it's, um, it's a pretty powerful, powerful thing. I think we'll talk a little more about that in the QA. Because Varnish has a VCL configuration system. You can actually change a lot of stuff. Uh, some of the stuff we let you change on Pantheon, some we don't. Uh, and then that can allow you to like, you know, implement separate kinds of use cases, like caching just for certain mobile devices or certain parts of the world, or you know, caching to certain regions of the page and not everything, whatever. T typically happening through uh, integration with CDNs. Correct. Especially for if you wanted to have distinct versions for different mobile devices. And uh, we're big fans of CDNs. We can also, in Q&A, definitely ask us about that. We have a lot of opinions uh, on all of that. Tip four uh, is, and tip, tip, tip four is a, is a tip that I think sort of basically it says to use an SS, uh, SSD database um, as sort of your starting point. 
This is something that actually has, I think, changed a lot in the last maybe you know four or five years. That traditionally, like you know, hard drives uh, would be you know spinning metal disks, and they would like you know be a lot slower. And that you know first like in smaller devices, then laptops and, and servers, you know, have these solid state drives, which are are, are like significantly faster for like a, for accessing information. And in the case of a database, since you're accessing information all the time, like having um, having that kind of like fast exchange is really really important. And um, so one of the tips, obviously, is to use SSD databases so that people have those databases, of course, by using Pantheon. We, uh, we use that, that really good stuff because it is much faster. And, um, and then we, uh, once you sort of have those databases, we uh, will put all your tables uh, using the sort of uh, InnoDB storage engine, um, which uh, is something that is a lot faster than, than alternatives and something that not everybody does. If you import an existing site to Pantheon, we'll change those for you, and if you have um, a uh, new site, we put that on there, but uh, sometimes, you know, if you have custom tables you create independently, it may not have the storage engine, you should definitely have it because it's faster. It might not show up in the benchmarks of individual pages, but it's really about the concurrency. Uh, because when you have a modern engine like NRDB, it has things like row-level locking so that every time you change a table, it doesn't have to block every operation on the table, like some of the old engines on MySQL do. Uh, and then even as you're making changes, there's something called multi-version concurrency control that it does, where it basically keeps a reference copy available of data so that uh, it can always read content out of the database, even if someone is manipulating it at that time. Uh, so it's just way better at juggling lots of users and uh, changes to content. Yeah, and I think that, and that gets into something sort of about performance that, that David touched on, was this, this idea of concurrency, uh, as well as this idea of sort of individual page speed. And that, like, when we talk about website performance in the context of WordPress, we're, we're talking about actually a number of different things. We're talking about, you know, sort of how fast an individual request can be, can be kicked back, how well the server performs if there's, like, you know, a thousand people having that same request, how well the server performs if there's a thousand people doing different requests, and vice versa. Because these are all situations that matter. Like, an individual page time response matters to that person. If your server can handle 100,000 people asking that same page, that's something that also matters. And so that's just something that we try to like, you know, uh, you know, just to clarify what's going on. Fifth tip, uh, which I think is the last one of this this piece, is um, is getting rid of the full text search in the normal MySQL MariaDB database. That it is in fact been possible to have full te full text index in MySQL and to search them using keywords. Uh, that will work. That's you know something WordPress does, uh, and but it's not great. It's it's not a very good search. It doesn't give you a lot of options for customizing search or waiting results. Like it's just a lot of like words you sort of throw together, um, and it's actually something that can make your site really slow. In part because the same database that's handling the search indexing and the searching, which is actually a very expensive operation, is also doing all the other stuff WordPress needs, like you know storing the data objects and the and the options and sort of doing all the assembly, taking that all when each page gets assembled. And so one of the tips, especially if you're using search in, you know, in a way that like, is common on the site, that instead of having WordPress's default search handle it, instead of having that, that MySQL handle it, you actually offload searches to something like Elasticsearch or an Apache Solar, which are much better and stronger search platforms. They have plugins for WordPress. You can integrate them. In the case of Apache Solar, we have a Pantheon. Uh, we run Apache Solar on Pantheon's platform as a way for you to hook into those external searches, and there's where all the searches go. So WordPress, is, WordPress then takes a normal database and generates all of the different stuff it needs from that, and then the searches go from this other thing, and you put the pages together, and that's a lot faster. You may notice a trend here of deburdening the database yes. in the sense of between the search index and the cache and the reverse proxy cache, um, uh, we're sort of trying to remove as much responsibility from the database as possible so that it can focus on its core task, which is complicated and, and burdensome enough. Uh, and then when we were mentioning SSDs for it, try to get it as accelerated as possible for its actual core task. Because, you know, the database is one of the, the key bottlenecks in, in WordPress performance. So you can take your WordPress application code and you can do a lot of stuff with the database. That is the fact, the power of the CMS. But that you can do too much and the database can be too weak and then it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't sort of work, work to work as well together. So that's sort of, you know, part of, part of what we're up to here. Uh, with all of this. So those are sort of the five tips that I had. Um, we also have some more Mega Man or uh, video game stuff right here. Uh, but I'd basically say that like in general like WordPress performance is something where it's all incremental and it's a lot about finding tips, implementing tips, and also doing some testing. And we'll talk a little bit about performance testing as well 
But uh, for now, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Andrew Taylor, uh, to show us some additional magic about the greatness of WordPress performance. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Um, actually, what I want to talk about is after you implement these performance steps, is how can you increase the performance of your team and optimize your workflows and also kind of automate some of the performance testing. Um, so what we're going to look at here is using the WP CFM plugin. It keeps WordPress configuration in code, which is nice so that when you move from a dev to test and live environment, if your theme has multiple options and things going on, you don't have to sit there and recreate those every time and go in and click around. And it also, will, your configuration changes will show up in your commit log. You can have them version controlled so everyone on your team also knows what's going on and you have that nice history there. Um, so the site we're going to be looking at as an example is actually a clone of this WordPress at scale site. And I'll go ahead and put this into the chat for everyone. Um, this is a site Pantheon created and put up for the community that has WordPress tips for running a site at enterprise scale. So a lot of the things uh, Matt talked about, where we have page caching and object caching, but we also have some query performance and things that you can definitely come and read up on if you're looking for a little bit more. The configuration change we're going to make is on that main banner. We've got this set up with the customizer so we can change what this banner looks like. And I'm just going to do a simple text color change um, to make this white so that it matches the actual site. On our test site, it was orange. So I can go ahead and save this. And now it's saved to the database. And what WPCFM allows you to do is create bundles of items, bundles of anything in the WP options table and commit those to code. Um, so I can see here that I've updated the banner color. And if I hit push, it's actually going to write that to the file system. And I can see that we have that change in a JSON file ready to be committed. So again, what's nice about this is it gives you team visibility into what you're doing, gives you that history with version control and also makes it so you don't have to update these configurations when you're going between environments. Um, you can imagine if we had a theme with lots of options and we updated maybe 20 things, you don't want to have to go through and redo that on test and live as well. So now I'm going to deploy this banner to test. And what's cool is we're also doing a lot of automation that's going to increase our team performance with Slack. So you can see here that using Pantheon's platform hooks to send out a Slack message when I made that initial change to make the banner white in the dev environment, again when we're deploying it to test, and we're going to also fire off some automated testing. Um, you can see here that WPCFM is importing our banner configuration. So now if I go visit the test site, we can see that that banner is white, and I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to log into WordPress. I didn't go have, have to go back to my settings. Um, I didn't have to change those. I didn't even have to go into WPCFM and do a poll to bring the changes from the code into the database. It was all done automatically. And also, we fired off some cross-browser testing, some visual regression testing, and some performance testing. So as you're optimizing your WordPress site and you're making all these performance updates, um, you can have automated testing along the way. You can get in there, really dig in, and figure out if those changes are making a significant impact on your application. We have tons of Quicksilver examples. Um, they're all open source on GitHub. So I'll put this into the chat as well. But one that is really good to enable is New Relic Deploy. If you haven't used New Relic, it really gives you insights into how your code is running and how your app is running on the server level and what that performance looks like. Looks like. So as you're making 
these upgrades, you can also check and see not just is my site performing fan faster to the user, is it loading faster, is this actually helping my server load so that as I scale up to more and more page views, I'm going to use those resources more efficiently. And what this hook does is sets a marker in New Relic every time you make a deployment. So if you deploy something like um, our Redis plugin and you enable that caching, then you can have that marker in there. You can go back and you can actually measure and see if that is making a difference for you and your site. So we can definitely answer some questions on that about scaling up um, performance within your team as well as within your code. But that's just a quick little demo of how you can automate some of the testing so as you're implementing these updates, you can make sure that it's actually making a difference. All righty, we're going to jump into some questions here. Um, we had some people email before the session, uh, but we are still taking questions, so submit whatever you have. Uh, the first one is, we just moved our website to Pantheon because we were told it has robust caching to help improve WordPress performance, but we're still seeing slow page loads, uh, especially the home page. We were told by our developer that it should, could be issues with Rocksprocket, but it could take a while to test that. What would you suggest? Well, uh, we, have, we have New Relic Pro running, uh, rolling out to the platform uh, for all projects on Pantheon at this point. Um, and that using testing tools like New Relic, which you can enable right now on the platform, helps you to understand sort of the issue of the problem. That one of the things that gets really important for figuring out performance is what actually is slow about it. You know, like that there are, you know, cases where your, your site is slow because you have like tons of front end assets that need to be downloaded and so it like looks really slow. Sometimes it's slow because the database has, gets overwhelmed. Sometimes it's slow because there's too much processing on the site. And that, you know, if you have a sort of performance issue, it's sort of important to figure out which part of that. And New Relic is nice because New Relic will actually give you breakdowns to say, here's how long the page took doing, dealing in the browser. Here's how long it took dealing in the database. Here's how long it took processing in PHP. Here's how long it took calling an external service that maybe was slowing it down. And sort of figuring those pieces, pieces out, I think, is important. Andrew, I think you also had something to jump in with. Yeah, I was going to say too, like Pantheon has, you know, Varnish out of the box, but if you're not using Redis and Solar that are optional add-ons, make sure you're using those um, because someone might have told you if Pantheon has awesome performance, which it does, but some of these things are optional and do require a little configuration. So if you haven't done that, uh, make sure you get those set up. Yeah, I would also say that, like, you know, something like um, uh, Varnish is something that's a great, you know, tool, but it is something that you can actually break on Pantheon depending on, you know, how you're setting cookies and, like, how you're doing sessions and other kinds of things. And so doing some, like, you know, Varnish, is Varnish working kind of test to make sure that everything works, is working correctly is important because if you override Varnish's cache on every page load, it doesn't matter you have Varnish because it won't actually cache any pages for you. All right, next question is, will Pantheon's Redis plugin work on sites hosted on non-Pantheon servers? Yes, it will. Um, the, uh, I was actually just looking at our WordPress uh, Redis code, and it's designed so that it automatically picks up the configuration if you're running it on Pantheon, but if you run it elsewhere, you can manually configure it to connect to a Redis instance. And there's nothing special about the Redis instances on Pantheon. The uh, You can just... Um, uh, we're running completely standard releases. And I linked the um, GitHub repository for our Redis plugin. You can also find it on WordPress as well. It is WP Redis. I believe it's called WP Redis is the one that we have official support for. All right, next question is uh, more of a statement, but it would be nice to address the issues of cookies preventing varnish from working entirely. Um, I totally understand the core reason and have read all the Pantheon documentation about the workaround, um, but in the world of plugins and modules, most of the time these are cookies that we don't have direct control over. Wow, that's, that's a tough one because uh, it literally gets down to what is considered correct for varnish's operation uh, because there are a lot of strict rules around what you can and cannot do 
in terms of making assumptions. Um, really, um, it kind of goes down to the HTTP spec being really um, not very granular about controls for this. You can basically say that a given header is, uh, is affecting the content. Uh, like whenever you pull up a page from say WordPress or Drupal, you're gonna see things like um, very colon cookie, comma, um, accept encoding, um, usually at least those two. And that's basically saying that based on the request from the browser um, and what it's sent in terms of what encodings it'll accept for like a compression of the page and, um, and whether it has a cookie for a session, that determines whether it can cache or not. And then it's sort of a game with cookies where uh, what you do is you basically have to break the spec a little bit and then create a whitelist. Uh, and you end up having to, um, to say some things are okay, some things shouldn't break the cache. Uh, and so we have documentation on the platform about what cookies uh, will or will not bypass the cache. Um, in general, um, rule of thumb is that uh, Google, Google Analytics stuff is excluded. Um, as well as any other cookies that start with underscore underscore. Um, that's been increasingly the convention for cookies that are designed for front end use and should not be affecting the content of the page. Um, if a cookie does affect the content of the page, we really can't ignore it for caching purposes uh, because it'll break um, the experience for other users who would have a different cookie. And, and then you enter into this kind of um, really um, unpleasant decision between do you just not cache at all or do you key it off the cookie and keying off the cookie is usually uh, not a viable option because you end up polluting the cache with tons and tons of documents that are only valid for single users. But I, I like the varnish documentation, the cookie documentation in the chat if you want to sort of check out some of that stuff Dave was talking about. Alrighty. Um, we'll pull up another question, um, and that is, how soon are you planning to have PHP 7 available on Pantheon? Um, we actually had a conversation about this this morning on the power users mailing list, uh, and it looks like it's on track for the summer. Um, a lot of it is about wrapping up um, all of the corresponding support that you, uh, that you have to come to expect on a system like Pantheon in terms of all of the other extensions for PHP being available, uh, compatibility for the different code bases that are getting deployed uh, onto it. Uh, WordPress broadly has PHP 7 capabilities, but a lot of WordPress uh, extensions don't necessarily have it all the way there. Um, and um, one part of what we like to do is develop documentation on what you can and can't do. Um, and uh, we have a page um, that documents WordPress extensions that are known to cause problems on, on the platform, um, typically ones that interfere with performance or scalability. And we would want to be um, well on the way of having that sort of documentation available before opening the support wide for uh, PHP 7. Right, uh, a follow-up actually to the last question um, about the cookies, this is the same person that initially asked and he said, this is my question, and WPML is the source of the issue, and they said a cookie despite it not being used by the front end unless you're using a specific feature. Whew. Um, so it sets, uh, so it sets its own cookie, um, and does that, does it, it's hard to, I'd have to kind of ask back and forth, um, but I'd have to know, like, does it affect the page content? Does it affect the behavior of WordPress or one of the extensions? I mean, it's, it's for the, it's, 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 so it's, it's presumably a cookie to do with some multilingual stuff. Okay. Um, but maybe you're not using the, you know, language isn't necessary at that point or that piece of page doesn't have multilingual content sending it anyway. There, there are a few options for this. Um, one is um, to literally go in and basically do a vendor fork of the module uh, to alter the cookie that it's using. Uh, like we do have a, a documented approach on, the, on Pantheon for keying uh, varnish rather than it, uh, skipping requests. One note, he did also say, and, and James, we can also follow up with you after this, um, he said, I disabled the cookie in the code, and the site, site still works in multi-language, and, the varnish, and then varnish does work. Okay, yeah. Um, basically, we try to play really safe with the varnish caching in the sense of uh, if the cookie is not known to be a session cookie for WordPress or Drupal, uh, and we don't know it to be an analytics cookie that doesn't affect page content, we typically take the safe approach and, uh, and skip the cache. 
uh, because otherwise the, we sort of have that uncomfortable decision of uh, are we opting for correctness or performance, possibly at the cost of correctness, and we typically opt for correctness. Like we'd rather have your site function um, than be broken and fast. Alrighty, moving and on one from that. Thing you can, can, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Andrew. Oh, yeah. One thing you can do to James is instead of forking that plugin, is check and see if it has a filter. Um, a lot of plugins will have filters, so you could go in and maybe potentially alter that cookie name to something that is compatible, or even remove it entirely without actually having to um, keep a separate fork going and keep it up to date. Yeah, um, and one I would look, definitely look into what we call the sticks key cookies on Pantheon, and what those do is a, it's a specific uh, uh, form of cookie that you can use as a naming convention to say to Varnish, I want you to key the cache based on the data in this cookie, uh, rather than skipping the cache or ignoring the cookie. Alrighty, next question. Um, if I have multiple VMs serving the same installation of uh, WP, what is the best way to set up Memcache? Uh, should work fine. Memcache is done over the network. Um, you will need to have a coherent set. Um, it gets quite complicated when you have a, multi uh, a set of servers because uh, when you start having multiple Memcache boxes, Memcache uses a, a hashing algorithm to determine what boxes get what content. And if that's not consistently configured among all of the servers, then you will have a totally inconsistent cache. Um, and this can be affected by um, things like the order of listing of the memcache servers in the configuration, um, and they're often configurable algorithms. Like there is sometimes consistent hashing versus um, more traditional hashing approaches, and they all affect where the information lives. Uh, and getting that wrong can cause lots of problems on the site. Um, so it's easy if it's one server, if it's multiple ones, be careful. But by multiple, I mean multiple memcache servers. Alrighty, next question. What were the tools for automated testing used with Pantheon Slack notifications on the demo? Andrew, you want to take that one? Yeah, we can pull back up. Um, performance testing was with load impact. So we can actually pop over here and just take a look at um, the report. It looks like it allows you to set up tests and specify, you know, how many users are pinging the site um, in kind of in what time period, so how many requests a second, things like that. Um, and we'll show you the URLs, if they are successful, average page speed across here. So you can definitely see um, through these reports, you can keep track of this and see with a decent amount of user load how your performance is doing. And if you deploy those updates, then you can come back in. Hopefully these metrics keep getting better and better as you go. Um, for visual regression, that was Backtrack, which is B-A-C-K-T-R-A-C dot I-O. Um, and that just does a visual diff. So you, this is more for like if you're making changes in the front end or you deploy, maybe you update plugins um, and you want to make sure that like your menus on your site aren't broken or things like that. This can do, just do a quick screenshot diff and show you what's going on there. And then cross-browser testing. Um, we use SpotBot. There's uh, many tools you can use there. And, and really, this automated testing with our Quicksilver hooks, you're just writing a PHP script. So anything that has an API that you can interact with, um, you can make calls out to. So you can use different services if you want to. We also have a growing library of examples uh, for Quicksilver integrations on, um, on GitHub. If you just search for Pantheon Quicksilver GitHub, uh, it'll pull it up. And uh, I can see in here we have Backtrack as one of the examples. Uh, so that's basically a drop-in script. You just configure it with your credentials. I don't know if we have one for load impact on here. Yeah, we do. We, do. It's, we have one that's in the pull, pull request right now. Um, Load Impact has a version 2 API and a version 3 API, and it uses both, and probably needs to be cleaned up to just use version 3. Um, I would just say more generally, like, you know, one of the things, if you're interested in WordPress performance, a really great, like, like thing to try out, like, now or later today or tomorrow, is to do a performance test on your site. Like, I just linked the documentation or performance testing info in the chat, but basically, like, you know, turning on the New Relic agent, running a couple different, you know, tests, 
load in that, you just type your URL in the in, on the home page and it'll run a test for you. And just looking at that information and seeing what's happening. All right, we have another question in regards to the demo. And that is, when you use the CFM plugin to export the config change, is a config, are the config changes automatically imported when you deploy? Or is there a specific second step? Um, you, um, it's, a, what, it's something you can do with Quicksilver. Uh, is the slide supposed to be? Yeah. Oh. Um, with the CFM plugin, by default, they're not automatically imported. Um, so you would have to, if you deployed from like dev to test or test to live, come in here, find that bundle, and hit pull, which is really still super useful if you have those 20 options or even 10 options, um, just a bunch that you don't want to have to redo. You can hit pull, and it'll actually bring them from the file system back into the database and apply them. But as David said, we automated this with Quicksilver. So there's a Quicksilver hook that fires every time you make a deployment on Pantheon. And we're just using that um, in conjunction with WPCLI to go ahead and import these automatically. Awesome. And there is an example for WPCFM imports in the Quicksilver example repository as well. Ready. Next question is: How do persistent cookies affect varnish? Persistent cookies. Um, well, most cookies are persistent, but the uh, <laughs> um, the uh, in fact that's a lot of the problem in terms of how they stick around and, and cause people to go from hitting cached pages to uh, bypassing the cache. Um, it's um, the basic rule in Pantheon is that if it's not a front end cookie. Um, it's going to be stripped out um, or bypass the cache unless it's a session cookie for WordPress or Drupal. And we uh, have some very specific rules around the patterns for those cookies. Uh, and there's not much we can do to change how those rules work without basically causing a broken proxy to be in place for a lot of sites. Uh, the only way to really start customizing that if you really want to get down to the gritty details is to throw a CDN in front of the platform. Uh, you can throw like Cloudflare or Fastly in front of the platform, and you can go to town with however much you want to customize the cookies before they hit Pantheon, or how you want to control your caching rules uh, for pages. Uh, and if you really need to get um, detailed with that, that's really the right way to go, because you can, um, you can be very precise about exactly how you handle it. Um, so, you generally either need to be able to control the application or to be able to control the caching rules. Uh, because you can pretty much get done whatever you want to get done on Pantheon as long as you can control the application and its use of cookies. Right, next question. Does Pantheon support HTTP2 with server push? Uh, we do not currently have support for HTTP2, but um, the big advantage for HTTP2 is that last mile uh, in terms of the communication between, say, a handheld device and uh, the server, and you can deploy that through a CDN. Uh, like if you deploy Cloudflare in front of the Pantheon, which you can do for free, and we have a guide for doing, uh, you can um, get HTTP2 for your sites. And the backhaul uh, back to Pantheon is actually still HTTP 1.1. In fact, providers like Cloudflare don't do backhaul over HTTP2 because the primary benefit is for mobile devices. So uh, it's really about that connection between your end user and the first connection they make to uh, the internet backbone in terms of a CDN at the point of presence. All right, next question. Uh, they said, sorry for such a basic question, but under settings Pantheon cache, the setting is 600 seconds. Is this, is this the default or is there a best setting? It's all based on how fresh your content needs to be. Uh, there are kind of two schools of thought when it comes to caching. Uh, you can cache for a short time and not have to worry that much about invalidation and pages changing. Uh, or some uh, place, some people prefer to cache for a long time and then invoke uh, APIs to do things like clearing the cache if you, say, publish a blog post uh, or a new page on the site or reorganize something or change the theme. Um, and um, we have a platform function to do that. I, I don't know all about the um, the deep in, it, what integration we're doing for WordPress with that, but 
Yeah, that like, you know, in general, like you want to make sure that you cache long enough so that, you know, you're not like rebuilding the page all the time, but also like, you know, not too long that like, you know, you've updated something and like it, you know, 20 minutes later is still serving stale content. Uh, 600 is a good, a good sort of, you know, starting point, you know, and I would say use that, see how you feel about it and go from there. But low numbers can actually be quite safe because uh, even if you cache content for a couple seconds, uh, you're dramatically throttling the maximum uh, hit from anonymous users because if you cache for one second, the most uh, amount of traffic you're going to get because you have um, three uh, varnish boxes in front of a site on Pantheon is you would have 180 requests per second. Uh, and then if you cache for two seconds, the most you're going to get for, say, the front page of the site or a major thing that everyone is linking to is going to be half that. Uh, and so basically, um, by even having a cache that's 10 or 15 seconds long, if you're really um, scared about stale content, you can still have a huge improvement to performance. Um, and one thing I want to add here is when you're using WordPress and object caching, is WordPress has transients, which usually hook in the database, but if you have an object cache, we'll hook in there as well. So if you had a Twitter widget in your sidebar, for example, that pulled the latest tweets, um, you might not need those to be reloaded every single page load. You might be okay with tweets coming in every two minutes or every five minutes. And so you can store the results of those API calls in a WordPress transit um, and do some caching that way. All right. Next question. Is Pantheon already using SSD databases, or is that an add-on feature? Uh, it's completely platform-wide. Great. And we have one more question. This is a long one, so stick with us. WordPress bundles uh, jQuery with it, and lots of guides mention not decoupling the bundled JavaScript. I get alerts from things like Google Page Speed to move all code blocking scripts to the footer, but to do that, you have to decouple jQuery to move to the footer, or does anyone have another solution? That's a tough one. Um, actually, when you enqueue scripts in WordPress, what you can do is dequeue the default um, jQuery script and re enqueue it. And there's a parameter that tells WordPress whether to print a script in the head or the footer. And you can unenqueue it, WordPress defaults to the head, and then you basically re enqueue it with that parameter you send it to the footer. But th this does get into an important topic, which is front end performance, uh, which uh, once you've got the basics down for a website, especially if you're getting pages cached out of Varnish, uh, one of the biggest bottlenecks that I see is uh, loading all sorts of assets from all over the web on the page uh, so that even if the page assets from Pantheon are reaching the browser in well under a second, uh, pages can sometimes take three, five, even ten seconds to load all the other assets from other uh, sources. Uh, and I often see uh, that front-end performance dominates uh, the issues for page load times. Um, there are great profiling tools in both um, Chrome and Firefox at this point, which basically show you the point at which the content kind of becomes available. Usually that's referred to as kind of DOM availability, the doc document object model. It's sort of when the browser has enough information to actually display the page and make it useful. Uh, and usually the goal is to get that down to under a couple seconds. Uh, and then it's sometimes okay for the rest of the assets on the page to take a good five or ten seconds longer as long as they don't actually break the ability to use the page. Uh, but it's, I can't tell you the number of times, like I, I've talked to um, people debugging issues for page performance on the platform and they, um, the page from the platform is actually coming through very quickly and it's really other assets that are slowing down the usable rendering time. Um, New Relic also has tracking data on uh, front-end performance in terms of uh, it can inject a little bit of JavaScript on the page and get sampled data from browsers and uh, uh, even by device to show you uh, basically how long your users are waiting for a site to be available. All right, we actually have some more questions come in, um, and that is, what sort of programming practices do you recommend in order to ensure that the code you write is performing as best it can? I mean, when it comes to websites, it's all about I.O. Um, it's all about the data sources you're accessing, the database, the caches, um, uh, things you might be transferring to external services. 
Uh, often we see um, cases where the bottleneck is something where you're accessing some third-party API from the web page and it just can't finish delivering the web page until it gets the response back. Um, again, this is a great thing to dive into New Relic to see, uh, where basically you can see um, uh, for you can pull up kind of transactions and see what's dominating. Like, are you is it the database time dominating the page loads? PHP is it some external resource that you're accessing? Um, and um, just knowing the basic category of issue can really help drill down. Um, and actually, I would, in terms of development practices, I would actually caution against what's called premature optimization, which is where uh, you focus on a micro optimization before you know whether it's going to have a major systemic effect on your user's time. Because it might be that you could spend a week optimizing some extension to WordPress or you could throw a CDN in front of the site and they both could have the same performance impact to you. All right, um, next question is, what's your opinion on using searching search tools such as uh, Algolia? How does it compare to solar? So um, I would say I don't know like as much about, about that particular tool, um, but I would say that in general, um, you know, there are a lot of hosted cloud services to do search that basically will it really have still the gap in the CMS world where like full text sort of database indexes are insufficient. And that, you know, from a performance standpoint, like any offloaded search is going to be better than using the like normal database. And so I think for us, like if you're looking at at you know Elasticsearch or you're looking at Solar or you're looking at Agolia, like these are things where like I mean it's going to be I think and for a performance standpoint they're all probably going to be about the same. It's going to ultimately come down for you about features of your application and like what specifically uh, you need you need around all of that. The, the only way that I would see running into issues is if you start treating the search API like a database. Uh, which there's nothing inherently wrong with that in terms of, say, finding similar content or recommendations. Uh, but it also means that your access is much more frequent and is blocking a lot of page loads. So if you're looking at using one of these external services where you might be connecting over an internet backbone link across a wide area network uh, to access them, uh, if you're doing it when someone does a search on the site, that's fine. If you're doing it on every single page load, that might have a substantial impact on performance. Uh, and that's actually one of the things you could actually try to spin out. Like even if you wanted to do it on every single page load, you could do something where it does an AJAX request back to it to fill in, say, the content recommendations after the page is already loaded. And some of these services actually offer front-end APIs where your JavaScript can directly access the service uh, and be able to pull results directly without having to go back through, say, WordPress. All righty, guys. Looks like the, those are all the questions we have for today. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or feedback, please visit our website where you'll find a Contact Us page, and we'll put you in touch with the best member of our team. And make sure you join us for our next edition of Couch Coding. Have a great weekend, everyone.